calls a dear friend of mine. Um, we met going to college together back in University of Illinois. In the dormitory, freshman year. And the dormitory. <laughs> so that, that friendship lingered and I think it's going. grew and all that. And uh, <laughs> Bo went on to get a doctorate in history, and now he's doing great things. And uh, Hiroshima is a professor at Peace Institute. And uh, there you go. <laughs> and thanks to all you guys for coming out. And uh, and sorry we're starting a little bit late, uh, but also just to just to continue this opening schmooze fest, uh, I really want to thank Brian Johnson and Julie Gordon for anyone who doesn't know them who are hosting this event. And in every organic sense of the word, these people have made this house a community center. Yeah. Many people here know that. This house is the scene of the best dinner parties, <laughs> the best holiday parties, and public events. This house has always been a center for a community. It's a, it's a model for how community functions, and you guys are fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, anyways, again, thanks for coming out. Uh, my sense of this is that I want this Pardon? Pardon? Well, there's some more seats. There's room up here, there's too. There's like four more seats. You, you can actually here. put your hand on both sides. Up there. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that cost extra. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to move forward. There's comfortable seats, even. Even family can move forward. Because a lower back is pain. Yeah. Yeah. And feel free to stand there. <laughs> um, so my sense of this is really informal. I want to talk about a handful of different things, but... I also know there's a variety of people here who also have a lot of knowledge and understanding of some nuclear issues and uh, other things I'll talk about. And so please, everybody, feel free to chime in and uh, don't be reluctant to, uh, to join in any way in the conversation. Uh, so my sense of it is informal. But I'll start by telling you, first of all, what I'm not, which is a scientist. Um, uh, <laughs> I'm a historian. And uh, my PhD is in history of science and technology, but I study culture and uh, I study science in society and culture. In a lot of ways, I don't care terribly much about how science works or what's true or not. Um, and I also don't care terribly much about uh, policy aspects of nuclear issues. Um, and so I'm not an expert on nuclear power. I have never studied nuclear power. Um, uh, but I have studied the history of uh, the history of the development and especially the history of the perception of nuclear issues, um, primarily in the United States. Um, and so uh, I can't talk about how the plants, the structures of the plants are beyond very, very surface things. Um, and I also can't tell you about exactly how radiation moves through the ecosystem or anything like that. These are not my areas of expertise, so I want to make that really clear. So partly what I talk about is how people understand what's happened, how people perceive what's happened, and how that is placed into the context of the earlier history of nuclear uh, incidents and nuclear uh, technologies. Um, so, that's, uh, so that's just to be clear. Um, anyways, uh, I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, myself. Um, I'm from Chicago. Uh, being a historian is my, is my second or maybe my third life. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, started my, I, I started my studies in university with my bachelor's degree when I was 30 after all four of my kids were born, three of whom are, three of whom are here in the room. <laughs> so I worked for a long time as a chef and worked for a long time in the uh, natural food business while I was going through school um, and uh, it was at 44 that I got my PhD and, uh, and got my first job in Hiroshima, Japan. Uh, I studied at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana uh, with a wonderful woman, Lillian Hodison, uh, for, for any historians of science in the audience. Um, and uh, anyway, so uh, and applying for jobs, I was working at Earl's Organic Produce over in San Francisco for people who know the organic produce world. I was working at Earl's as the fruit buyer and uh, finishing my PhD and um, looking for jobs and one of the jobs was at the Hiroshima Peace Institute in Hiroshima, Japan and so I applied for that as well and that was the job that I got offered and the job actually was my preferred job so 
I very luckily fell right out of uh, being freshly uh, um, freshly minted with a doctorate into a research position in Japan, which is incredibly lucky. So in my position, I have very little teaching or administrative responsibilities, um, which is astonishing, again, for an entry-level job. Uh, so I work at the Hiroshima Peace Institute. It's an institute in Hiroshima, Japan. It's part of the Hiroshima City University. Um, Hiroshima City University is a pretty new university. Uh, it's about 15 years old. Um, Hiroshima Peace Institute is a little, just a little younger than that. And it was born out of anxiety in Hiroshima over preserving the memory of the bombing of Hiroshima. Uh, there's for quite a while been anxiety in Hiroshima and Nagasaki about how to keep this history alive. And so at some point, the city council decided to create a peace institute. Um, vaguely modeled on the idea of CIPRI, the uh, Stockholm uh, Institute for Peace Research. Um, and the idea being that 50 years from now, people would associate the word Hiroshima with peace, still. Um, so this was the original vision of the institute, and I always try to remember that I work for the citizens of Hiroshima. They pay my check, and, um, and so I have a responsibility to them in my job. Um, my institute is a small institute. It's only 11 scholars. Uh, they're interested in peace in a variety of ways. Some of them work on uh, genocide issues. Some of them work on conflict resolution in Korea or in Southeast Asia. Um, some of them work on Hibakusha issues. Uh, some of them work, a handful of people work on nuclear issues. Hibakusha, sorry. Uh, I'll define. Um, Hibakusha is a Japanese word which is a reference to someone who has survived the attack on Hiroshima, the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima mm. and Nagasaki. Literally means explosion affected person. So a hibakusha is a survivor of a nuclear attack. Um, the term is more broadly being used, though, to mean radiation-affected people, people who've been exposed to radiation um, outside of the nuclear attack on Japan. Uh, so, um, so anyways, only a handful of people work on issues related specifically to Hiroshima or to nuclear weapons. I'm one of the few people who do that in my institute. Um, so that's where I work. and. Um, uh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a little bit about the, um, or actually, maybe a better way to frame it would be: I'll tell you a little bit about the work that I do, and then talk about Fukushima a little bit. Uh, I started out um, working on per perception of nuclear technologies in American culture and representation of nuclear technologies in American culture. So what that means is, uh, I look at what people think nuclear weapons are what people think happens when a nuclear weapon explodes, what people think radiation does uh, and is like, what people think a nuclear war is like, how people think you survive a nuclear war. So I'm interested in some ways in what these things are, but I'm also interested in the stories people tell about what these things are. Um, uh, and for me, uh, for me, so for example, um, in a science fiction movie in the 1950s, if you start the movie by somebody having a Geiger count, and it goes click, 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 click. You can do anything now. Everybody knows if there's radiation, all rules are suspended. You can have gigantic bugs. You can have people that are half lobsters. You don't have to explain why. Everybody knows because radiation is there. This is fascinating to me. So radiation kind of became this, uh, this token of suspension of rules. Um, so this sort of analysis of culture is the sort of stuff that I do. Um, and... Uh, part of where my work is focused and what motivates me is that um, I, I looked in my dissertation, and then this was my first uh, book that I published. Uh, one of the things that I'm very focused on is how people learned immediately in 1945 and 1946 about nuclear weapons. Um, when the bombs went off, everybody in the, nobody understood what a nuclear weapon was, except for a small group of people in the whole world. Um, it's very abstract, and it's hard to understand now really, what a nuclear weapon is, um, what happens when a nuclear weapon detonates. Uh, but everybody realized after Hiroshima and Nagasaki that this was pretty important, and they really wanted to figure out what is this, what is this technology. So there was a ton of articles, a ton of books educating people about nuclear issues in 1945, 1946, 1947. Um, and in reviewing all of this literature, there's an astonishingly singular story told about nuclear weapons. Not about what, how they work, but about what it means for them to exist. And what that is, is that 
nuclear weapons are a sign that the world is about to completely change. Either in the future we are going to learn how to not have wars, we either have to learn how to not have wars or we're going to kill ourselves. Nuclear weapons are such a dangerous weapon in the hands of human beings that we have to learn how to, if we continue to operate as we had been operating, World War I, World War II, these gigantic destructive wars, uh, and you add in this new weapon, that would be the end of the world, or else people have to change somehow. So for me, one of the things that's the key about this is that the first thing that people really learned about nuclear weapons was that they were signifiers of impending social transformation. Either the future was going to be a utopia or it was going to be the end of the world. But it wasn't going to be like the past and the present. And that's fascinating to me. Um, so they became symbols of impending transformation uh, of some sort. And so this is one reason that nuclear symbols and icons played the kind of role they did in sci-fi. You know, that if you have radiation, it means anything can happen because they all had this, nuclear technology has always had this cultural, uh, this cultural aspect to it that it's somehow transformative. It's somehow, and, and part of it also has to do uh, with the alchemical nature of changing an element into another element. So there's, which, which happens in, uh, which happens in uh, nuclear, uh, I'm not even sure the, right, the best way to phrase it, but which happens in, um, in the release of energy from uh, nuclear fission. Um, and perhaps that's not exactly the right way to phrase it. But, uh, but anyways, the fact that there is a uh, transformation, of, of, which, which is an old alchemical, um, an old alchemical uh, belief and vision of transforming one. Uh, so there's this magical tone, always, to nuclear culture, an expression of nuclear things in popular culture or in, in our world. Um, and so uh, this is the kind of stuff that I study. How do people, how do people learn to think about what happens? The fact that people learn to think that nuclear weapons were a sign that probably things were going to have to change in the world, that people were going to have to change, societies were going to have to change, or a war was going to have to end. Or for many people, there was a, a sense that inevitably humans would probably kill ourselves with nuclear weapons. Um, because if you add nuclear weapons into a war like World War II, then you have a very catastrophic future. Um, another thing that's important about nuclear weapons for me in studying them is that all through history, there have been stories of the end of the world and mythologies about the end of the world. These myth mm. But these stories, the end of the world is always, uh, it always occurs at the discretion of, of a deity, of a god. It's always a god who ends the world. Maybe as a response to human immorality or as a response to something about humans, but gods end time and gods end the world. With nuclear weapons, for the first time, there was an existing technology that people believed could end human civilization completely in the hands of mundane human beings. Matter of fact, people that we probably don't think will behave well with them, military leaders, political leaders, people like that. So things that had previously been mythical and religious suddenly became actual and technologically present. Uh, this, this also gives a religious sheen to nuclear issues. So these are the kinds of things that I started studying um, and that I started working on. But um, after I went to Hiroshima, I began to get much more engaged with issues related to people who've been exposed to radiation and survivors of uh, the bombings in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And, um, and I've been working the last few years on a project uh, with a colleague of mine from Australia, uh, Mick Broderick, um, called the Global Hibakusha Project. And there's that Japanese word, Hibakusha. Um, and what we're interested in is studying radiation-affected communities from atmospheric nuclear testing. So we work in communities around the world where nuclear, atmospheric nuclear testing had occurred. Um, just to review very quickly, in, in history there have been over 2,000 nuclear tests. Uh, the only continents to not have nuclear testing are Antarctica and South Africa, or South America. Every other continent has had nuclear testing on it. Um, in Nevada, there was over a thousand tests in Nevada alone. Um, nuclear testing originally was done in the atmosphere. Bombs were exploded in the air. After 1963, the United States and the Soviet Union negotiated a treaty to move nuclear testing underground. Um, nuclear testing in the atmosphere distributed quite a bit of uh, fallout radiation 
near the nuclear test sites and also downwind around the world. And there was a public outcry in the late 50s. This forced US and Soviet nuclear testing underground in 1963. Nuclear testing underground does not contaminate nearly as much outside of the test site spot as nuclear testing in the atmosphere. Um, so nuclear test sites where atmospheric testing was done are frequently very contaminated uh, with radionuclides as a result of the testing. Um, nuclear testing, for the most part, is very connected to colonialism. Um, the nuclear powers that test almost exclusively test in colonial reaches of their empires. Um, so for example, the United States began to test nuclear weapons in the Marshall Islands in 1946. Uh, for military and scientific reasons, the US also began to test weapons in Nevada in 1951. And those are the two test sites that the US operated and still does operate the Nevada test site. Uh, the Soviet Union tested weapons in Kazakhstan. Uh, which was kind of a far reach of the Soviet Union with a population of people uh, with very little political power. Um, the British began testing in Australia. Um, the French began testing in Algeria, uh, and then later tested in French Polynesia. Uh, the Chinese tested in far western China, where the Uyghur population is also a minority population with no political rights. So the history of nuclear testing is connected to colonialism. And nuclear testing is done near marginalized populations where people have no political recourse. The French did not test upwind from Paris, for example. Um, although the US did test in Nevada. Uh, but there were reasons, there were reasons that, are, uh, that relate to some degree to the marginal nature of the people living around the Nevada test site that that site was chosen as well. Um, so nuclear testing happens in these sites. Uh, so what, what we do is two things. Um, one is we, th these communities, some of them have been studied fairly extensively epidemiologically. So they've been studied for the medical health and impact, the medical health of the people, the exposed population, the health of the, uh, who, and uh, how it correlates to their exposures. So that, that's been studied in some communities, but social and cultural things have not been looked at at all. Um, so we, we examine the social and cultural fallout of nuclear testing on these populations in the Marshall Islands and Australia and Kazakhstan um, and in a handful of other places. Um, so this is sort of scholarly work where we're examining some of the things that have happened, some of the disruptions, uh, some of the ways in which it's linked with colonial history. But when we began to work in these communities, we also began to, uh, we were very conscious of scholars, especially uh, humanities scholars, social science scholars, parachuting into communities, third world communities, uh, extracting data and stories and then taking off. And it's another form of colonialism in some ways. And there's, in these com test site communities, there's some suspicion of scholars coming in, wanting to find out local stories and so forth, because there's been a history of people coming in who then disappear and nobody has any idea what's ever happened to their stories, their photographs, artifacts, things like this. So uh, we're very conscious of trying to work with communities and to bring resources to communities instead of removing resources from communities, even if those resources are stories and artwork and things like that. Um, and so in each of these communities, the elders in the communities would tell us that they really are struggling to try to find ways to get young people in the community to engage with this history and to learn the history and to carry the history on. And that it's just like in Japan, where we have anxiety about the passing of the Hibakushan generation, there's this anxiety about keeping this history alive. And so we, we ended up coming up with this other program, which is now really at the center of our research project, which is to um, use Web 2.0 technologies to link young people in all of these radiation-affected communities. Hmm. So I'll explain how that works. Um, in the past, links between test site communities have always been between elites. Uh, people who speak English and who can travel to conferences and tell the stories of their, the Marshallese or tell the stories of the Kazakh villagers. Um, but, uh, and so it's dependent usually in each community on one person or two people, and they tend to be educated people. Um, but we realized that partly because of things like this, there's this new opportunity for young people to, uh, to play a completely different role. Um, so we've started to do things in these communities, for example, 
to have trainings with young people where we distribute really, really cheap video cameras and we teach them how to do oral history interviews um, with their grandparents, with their elders, uh, using phones. Um, and so, we're, so we have, in each of these communities, groups of young people who are engaged now in producing cultural material, producing songs or art or video related to the nuclear experience of their community. And we're assembling all of this onto a website in which each of the works will be translated into the indigenous languages of every group that participates. So we are having Skype talk events where kids in the Marshall Islands and kids in Hiroshima all talk together for an hour. So we're trying to build community, essentially, between, these <coughs> between the young people in these communities. Uh, and part of our goal is, first of all, to engage them with their local history, but also to think that down the line, as they become older and they become more in touch with the needs of their community and uh, the history of their community, that they will have resources all around the world. They'll have other people. And uh, right now, these communities are very isolated. Uh, so we are trying to link them together, basically. Um, so anyways, uh, so I'm at work. Then, uh, then I'm at work on March 11th, or uh, on March 11th, uh, 2011 in Hiroshima in my office. And, um, and I get a call from a friend of mine in L.A., a Skype call from a friend of mine in L.A., who asks, are you okay? And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay, I'm fine. And he said, did you feel the earthquake? And I said, no. And he said, oh, there's a huge earthquake in Japan. Uh, and so I said, oh, you know, I pull up, I'm at work, so I pull up on my computer and see that there's a really big earthquake up in northern Japan. And uh, so that's how I found out about the earthquake. Um, and so I called my wife on Skype at home uh, in Hiroshima and said, hey, you know, the told her about the earthquake. And so we both put on NHK, uh, Japanese, you know, it's like the BBC, the Japanese national broadcaster. Um, we put on NHK on our computers, and we still have Skype open, so we're just talking to each other while we're both watching NHK on the computer. And, uh, and so we're watching live helicopter coverage of the tsunami coming ashore. And, you know, the helicopters are just up there, and you just see this wall. I mean, everybody's seen all of this footage. Um, and, you know, we were watching this live and thinking, I'm sure everybody's out of that house. I, you know, I'm sure all the people got out of that car because we couldn't believe we were watching thousands of people die, you know, live on TV. Um, so we were really, really, uh, you know, just glued to this for hours, of course. And... Uh, it was, um, you know, we were far away. We're about 700 kilometers away, so we didn't feel anything at all. You know, we had no impact at all where we were. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really tragic. Everybody, everybody was walking around with a terribly glum look on their face. I, I, I want to tell you a little bit about just how this happened for me personally um, to start to talk about Fukushima. But uh, um, then I was on my way home. I was riding my bike home, and I got a phone call uh, from a reporter from Russia Today TV um, that I knew, because uh, I had been interviewed on Russia Today TV on August 6th, the anniversary of Hiroshima, in the past. Hello, Dixie. <laughs> and so I think I might have been the only person in Japan whose phone worked, that they had the number, because all the phones were out in Japan. Oh, really? um, so they couldn't reach anybody, and so they called me and uh, asked me if I would go on the air and talk about the reports about problems at the nuclear plants. Um, and so I went home and, uh, and basically tried to gather, continue to gather news about what was going on up north. Uh, and, I went on, uh, and I went on Russia Today that night. Uh, and then over the next few days, uh, I, I, ended up on, I ended up being interviewed on Russia Today and a few other news things a bunch that first week or two, partly because I got identified as someone in Japan who could talk about nuclear things. Um, but the next few days were, uh, were really like living through a nightmare for me. Because I'm a nuclear paranoia. That's how I got into this business. <laughs> and, I, and so, of course, I have these paranoid fantasies of a nuclear meltdown. I just didn't think of three nuclear meltdowns. I just didn't think big enough. Um, and so for me, it was like I was living in my nightmares, except everybody else was there too. <laughs> that was really scary, the fact that everybody else was in the nightmare. Um, but uh, over the next couple days, 
the planets were exploding one after another, um, and uh, it was it was incredibly tense time in Japan. But for are, are there many people here who don't know about exactly what happened at the plants? Do you want me to talk a little bit about what happened at the plants? Okay. Um, uh, there's there's a little bit of controversy about what happened at the plants, um, but the the earthquake was a nine point earthquake. It was a massive earthquake. It shook for minutes violently, and the vi more violent parts were after it started, not like the first shakes, and uh, um, just had to be horrifying for people. Just utterly horrifying. Um, Forty five minutes to an hour later, the tsunami came ashore at the plants. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot of evidence that the plant, at, at Fukushima there are six, there's Fukushima 1 and Fukushima 2. Fukushima 2 is not unimportant for this story. Fukushima 1, there are six nuclear power plants. Wow. There are four nuclear power plants essentially down at ground level and two nuclear power plants on a hill. Uh, the ground level where the four nuclear power plants are used to be a hill, but the hill got knocked down so they could be down at ground level. Um, there's a, there is a tsunami barrier built there that wasn't even half as tall as the tsunami that hit. Um, there's a lot of evidence that the, num the, the number five plant and the number six plant did not experience meltdowns, did not experience the burning of fuel as far as we know. The ones, um, on, the the ones on the hill. The four on the ground, three of them were operating, the fourth one was not operating. It was shut down for refueling. Um, the three that were operating on the ground all had full meltdowns. The fourth one had a massive explosion from a fire in the spent fuel pool, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, but uh, the number one plant, the first plant, uh, there's a lot of evidence that it was melting down before the tsunami got there. Um, there's a strong effort by the Japanese government and by TEPCO to insist that the tsunamis caused the meltdown. But there's a lot of evidence that the earthquake actually caused the meltdown, um, uh, of, of which I can direct people to different articles that discuss workers talking about some of the things that were happening in the plant, pipes bursting, uh, all kinds of things going on, which one could imagine from a nine-point earthquake. Um, and so uh, anyways, uh, the, plants, the plants all started to, uh, what, what happened was, First of all, the, uh, everything got shook up by the, by the earthquake, of course. So all kinds of things were walls pulling apart from other walls and things. There was a lot of damage done. Then the extremely large tsunami then flooded the plant. Um, the, one of the key problems for the plant is that the backup, the, just like in almost all of northern Japan, the power went out when the tsunami came, when the earthquake and tsunami hit, all the power lines, a lot of them came down. The backup power for the nuclear power plant, for the reactor, uh, the backup generators in Fukushima were in the basement of the plant. So when the tsunami hit, they were completely inundated. So they were removed. Um, so what happens is if you don't have electrical supply to a nuclear power plant, you cannot cool the fuel, and the fuel will heat up and melt. Um, and so the struggle in this situation is to continue to get power to the plant, power to the cooling system of the plant. So the power was cut. Uh, the backup power is, the, the primary backup power, there's batteries. The primary backup power past the batteries is these generators. The generators were then lost. So once the backup battery power was out in each reactor, the temperature started to rise and the fuel melts. Um, uh, in, and I don't know the tech, the uh, um, I don't know the technology or the reactions well enough to talk about why hydrogen hydrogen vented out and exploded, but uh, but this uh, was partly how the explosions happened was hydrogen explosions. Um, meanwhile, the fuel has melted and gone down to the very bottom of the reactor vessel, and there's some belief that some of the fuel has melted through uh, or gone through vents uh, at the bottom of the reactors. So this fuel is, this, uh, this, when a nuclear power plant is operating, the nuclear fuel rods that are being used as fuel inside of them, when they are done, uh, they need to be cooled for years still before they are safe to just store. Um, and so, for example, in the number four reactor, 
there's a very large spent fuel pool. When a nuclear reactor, like the number four reactor, is being refueled, the reactor core is opened, the fuel is taken out of it, and put into a very large pool, essentially a gigantic swimming pool, uh, where water is circulated and it's cooled, and new fuel is put in. So this is what had happened in the number four reactor. The fuel that had just been taken out was in the fuel pool. The number four reactor has a very large fuel pool, so it stored a lot of rods, besides just one core's worth. So there's a lot of rods uh, stored in the number four fuel pool. That has to have cooling, too. So the number four reactor, the power went out to that. So that stopped cooling. That The heat from the rods boiled all the water away, and that fuel started to melt, and there was a fire there. Um, the problem with the spent... One problem with spent fuel pools is that they are not in containment. The reactor cores are in containment vessels that, in theory, will contain a lot of the radiation coming from the core. But in the spent fuel pool, it's essentially a lot of spent fuel rods in a giant swimming pool. Um, and so when there's a fire in that fuel pool, there is no containment to contain a lot. So uh, there's a significant release of uh, radionuclides into the atmosphere at that point in the fire and then in the explosion. So you, you have a completely chaotic situation at these reactors. You have a lot of infrastructures destroyed because of the earthquake, because of the tsunami. Um, at, one point, at one point, a lot of information has come out about insane things that happened while this was all going on. TEPCO, when the number four fuel pool was on fire at one point, this is now, we now have video of the TEPCO video conferences during the first uh, days of the, um, of the disaster. And one person saying that, well, we have to do something about the fire in the number four fuel pool. And someone else says, can we call the fire department? I mean, is that technically doing something? So they called the fire, they called the fire department, who refused to come put out the fire in the number four fuel pool um, because of the danger to the firemen. Um, so, this is, so this is how this tragedy started. Um, and that is what it is, and it's just terrible. Uh, but my, my own place in all of this is looking at how it affects the people in those communities. Um, I'm, uh, as I say, I'm not an epidemiologist, so I can't talk about how it help affects their health. Uh, I, I can talk a little bit about that, but not with any expertise. Um, but I can talk about how it's disrupted um, these communities and disrupted the country and disrupted, uh, and even in some cases, disrupted families. Uh, for me, I've talked to people who are exposed to radiation, usually when they were exposed to it 40 or 50 years ago. And they're looking back on their lives from exposure that happened from nuclear testing in the 50s or something like that. Um, and so uh, I, don't talk, I have not talked to a lot of people exposed to radiation who were just exposed to radiation. So, uh, you know, I'm a historian. And so in Fukushima, it's very easy for me, having talked and done a lot of work in, with Hibakusha communities, to see this large group of people, hundreds of thousands of people, at the beginning of this journey that I typically hear about when people are telling me when they're at the end of this journey. And it's heartbreaking. It's just heartbreaking. Um, because there is so much social disruption whether it's necessary or unnecessary. There's so much social disruption that accompanies exposure to radiation in, in communities. Um, and the only thing that is ever done is that if they're lucky, people receive medical help. But the other disruptions are never done. And the, there's the, the, the amount of emotional distress, mental health, depression that follows, um, the breakdown in communities that follows radiation exposure is, is terrible, and it's never addressed. Um, so, for example, uh, you have the Japanese government evacuated people. They waited. They knew people were being exposed to radiation, and they did, and they did not really. There was a lot of terrible behavior in this event in which the Japanese government completely failed to protect people failed to inform people, um, and it's scandalous. Uh, TEPCO, the company that ran the plant, was beyond criminally negligent. The, the things that were undone, the safety procedures that were undone in these plants, the cutting of corners, the paying off of people, the fake paperwork, 
It's just, it's terrible. Yeah, before the... Before that. Oh, yeah. Tepco had already been found guilty in court of faking video evidence about another nuclear incident at another nuclear plant. So, um, so there's a real history of deceit. Um, uh, so you have... Um, these people, are, a lot of people... The government knew where the plumes from the explosions in the plants were going, but they did not warn people. They sometimes gave people advice that allowed that, that led to them being exposed to larger amounts of radiation. Um, but anyways, after public pressure, mostly coming from other countries, the Japanese government's reluctance to move to do anything, uh, to do to, to take bold responses to the problems of the population near the plant. The Japanese government announced an evacuation up to 12 kilometers from the plant um, and suggested evacuation up to 20 kilometers. Um, within a few days, the Soviets had evacuated up to 30 kilometers at Chernobyl and bust everybody out. Uh, Soviets did plenty of things wrong, but they also did plenty of things better than the Japanese government did, uh, which is surprising. Um, but anyways, uh, one of the next things that they did because essentially, uh, they, they rate, there's a legal permissible amount of radiation that people can be exposed to. Um, there's a legal amount that a nuclear plant worker can be exposed to. If you're a nuclear plant worker, you can be exposed to X, uh, uh, X Rankins, uh, or um, it, it's smaller, smaller units, but certain measures of radiation. There's international standards for how much nuclear workers can be exposed to. Uh, there was also national standards in Japan about how much radiation civilians could be exposed to and children. So they immediately simply raised that legal standard by 24. So it's now legal to receive 20 times as much radiation as it was legal to receive yesterday. Um, and they raised it specifically for children. Uh, and that really infuriated people, a lot of people in Japan. Um, because it appeared, and it certainly continues to appear, that the priority was not protecting children, but that the priority was simply making legal what was being done. Uh, the permissible level was raised because they were exposed to it, so it's now legal. Um, so there, uh, from the beginning, I would say that the Japanese government has managed this almost entirely as a public relations issue, and not, uh, and not nearly as much as a public health issue um, or as an industrial uh, disaster. Uh, they, uh, they worked extremely hard to keep the word meltdown out of the press. Uh, they knew that the three plants had melted down in the first few days of the disaster. They insisted for months that there was no meltdowns. They insisted for months that 2% of fuel had melted or 4% of fuel had melted in one or another reactor. And then after two and a half months, they said, yes, there were three plants. So they knew this all along, and they lied the entire time about that. Um, so when finally the Japanese government admits that these three plants had fully melted down, the story was on page 20, because Fukushima was no longer a front page story. So when the world was focused on Fukushima, they successfully kept the word meltdown out of the press, denied that there were meltdowns, and lied, essentially. Um, so they've been primarily managing this both fiscally and from a public relations point of view. Um, there is, a, I know there's this very strong effort underway by the Japanese government to uh, sell food from northern Japan uh, as safe and radiation free. Mm -hmm. It's a huge effort in Japan. Everywhere in the stores, there's support Fukushima, support the farmers, you know, and, uh, but nobody buys the food. Nobody wants to buy the food. Um, but I've met students who have, foreign students who've been brought to Japan by the Japanese government on a six month program where they pay for everything, including haircuts, parties, everything. And once a month they're brought to Fukushima and, and given all these lectures about how safe the food is. Um, so the Japanese government, uh, immediately after this happened, um, all of the nuclear power plants, not immediately, but in the next few weeks, all the nuclear power plants in Japan got turned off. Um, I think there's 52 nuclear power plants in Japan, uh, although 48 because four of them exploded. Um, so 
All of those got turned off in the next few weeks, partly under a program where the government said that it needed to conduct stress tests to determine that these plants were safe and that they were not on active balls and so forth. Um, there was virtually nothing done. It, it, it was a classic kind of, let's close them and say we're going to have an inspection, and then six months later, let's say, well, it looks like the inspection was great, and reopen them. Um, the, there, every community where these nuclear power plants are located, there's intense opposition to reopening these nuclear power plants. Um, the Japanese government will reopen them all, though. They will try to reopen them all. Uh, they, it, it's entirely an economic thing for the Japanese government. First of all, uh, Japan has got no fossil fuels, so we have to import our energy, or that's what we believe. Um, and so uh, right now, without the power plants running, we're importing coal and gas, and there's no hitches in electrical availability in Japan at all. Um, but that's all imported power, and that's all somebody else's profit, first of all. Um, uh, second of all, uh, I would say that if you, if you own, uh, if you own a football team and you pay $100 million for a star player and your star player is playing very badly, you're still putting that star player in the game because you're paying $100, $100 million to them. Japanese utilities have built these plants. They've invested a phenomenal amount of money in them. They're not going to walk away from them. It's too big an investment to just say, you know what, we don't think they're safe anymore. Um, it, it would be... A, you know, somewhat equivalent to a sports team saying, we're just going to scrap all of our starters and just hire some new guys. Um, it's, the way that the government looks at it is that the Japanese economy is dependent on these utility companies, and these, depend, these utility companies are dependent on their investments in nuclear power. Uh, and that's, entire, that's, all they, that's all we need to see. That's, so they, they will try to reopen them. There will be a lot of community opposition. Um, but to get back to the people in northern Japan, uh, these are people who now largely feel that for decades they were lied to. Uh, they were lied to about the safety of these plants. They were lied to about the uh, lack of uh, the statistical impossibility of a problem, of a meltdown. Um, so you have this history of feeling as though you've been lied to for a long time. And then on one day, your whole life transforms. As, as one of the survivors of Chernobyl said, right when Fukushima happened, everybody in this area will define their lives as before Fukushima and after Fukushima from now on. And that's absolutely true. Their lives are completely turned over in the course of a day because of this horrible natural disaster, but also because of industrial neglect, regulatory uh, inadequacy, also lots of human causes to this, to this problem. Um, and so, first of all, your, your, your former life was a lie. You bought into this lie. Then, because you believed it, you never, you, you put yourself in a position where one day you lose your house, you lose, you can't ever go home again, um, you lose your job, you lose your, your living, you're not sure if you're going to be sick, you're now living in an apartment in some other prefecture where you don't, where everybody speaks different than you do, and people eat different than you do and everybody thinks you're contaminated because you're from Fukushima. And all of this, suddenly these people are thrust into this position. Um, while this is all happening, they're continuing to be lied to. So the, the emotional process, first of all, of, re of, of, of realizing that, you have, that you've been lied to and deceived by authorities that you placed a tremendous amount of faith in, and that... Uh, a lot of the things that defined your sense of self are no longer are no longer there. It's all spiraling away, and people find themselves in uh, living in uh, little apartments or living in high school gyms for a year or two, hoping they're going to go back to their homes, and their communities are completely dissolved. You know, scattered to a hundred different places. People are experiencing a tremendous amount of. Uh, bullying. Children are being bullied in schools because they come from Fukushima. Cars, people don't refuse to pump gas into cars with Fukushima license plates. Um, all of the fears and anxieties that people have about radiation uh, and about nuclear issues just rise to the top. And people who are suspected to have been exposed to radiation are treated as pariahs, almost always. Um, uh, it started in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People won't want to marry them because they're afraid that they're going to have children with birth defects. 
Uh, people won't hire them because they'll be afraid that they'll be sick more often than other workers. There's all of these subtle levels of discrimination that just will add up in these people's lives. But <clears throat> the main thing is that their families and their communities are scattered. Um, a lot of people in this area have, these, this is a really old traditional farming and fishing area. And a lot of people have been on the land for generations, as far back as anyone knows, on the same land. Um, and that creates a real sense of identity, a real sense of self. Uh, this is my land. My great-great-grandparents built this, sort of farmed this. And, um, uh, and, I, and then added to that are the other ways in which people construct their sense of self and their sense of well-being. For example, um, everywhere that I have talked to Hibakusha, one of the most important things is the disconnection from ancestors that happens when, when uh, land is contaminated or people are evacuated from land. Um, in, in the Marshall Islands, uh, after a, a nuclear test in 1954, the Bravo test, a couple of atolls were blanketed with very, very high levels of radioactive fallout. Um, the, US, uh, the, US, uh, the US radiation monitoring team came to this one atoll uh, on the lap atoll to measure the radiation, and they freaked out and got their boat left. Uh, the next day, a huge U.S. boat came and told everybody on this atoll, you have one hour to gather your belongings and get on this boat. And they were removed, and they haven't gone back. Um, and they live, uh, their history has been a checkered history, but mostly they live as refugees on other people's land. And so people who used to be in a position where they owned property, where they had access to wealth, where they had access to resources, uh, are suddenly now living on US government dependency because they're evacuated in corrugated huts in somebody else's land where there are outsiders and interlopers. And they've been there for generations now. Um, and they can't go back to where their ancestors lived and where they and where they lived. And many of the people, many of the young people have never been to the atoll that they, that they come from. Um, in, uh, in Australia, there was a program to compensate people for loss of land and loss of life because of exposure to radiation from nuclear testing. But in uh, the Aboriginal communities that live in, the center, in, that live in the area where the testing was done in Australia, it's taboo to say the name of someone who's died out loud. So when they were asked, you know, have, have any members of your family died as a result of this exposure, they would say no, even though it wasn't true, because it's, mm. so, so you, you have these disconnects like this, um, but, uh, but for example, in northern Japan, I've, I've, I've written this, if anybody's been uh, sort of following a little bit of the work I've done on this, but you have, for example, the holiday of Obon, uh, Obon's in uh, August, and it's a holiday of honoring um, ancestors. And so people return to their village where their family's from, because maybe they're in Osaka, but their family's from such and such prefecture. They return to their village where their family's from uh, for three days in, uh, in August. And the family goes to the cemetery and decorates the graves of the ancestors and sings songs to welcome the ancestors' spirits back. The spirits of the ancestors come down to earth and come to the family home and are honored. And, uh, and then on the third day, there's rituals to sort of escort their spirits back to where, uh, where their ashes are interned. And, uh, and this ensures a continuity. It ensures the blessing and the, uh, and the beneficent presence of ancestors. Uh, they're honored. They return the honor by providing sustenance from the earth and uh, good weather and so forth and so on. And, um, the people, people who, live, who lived in the evacuation zone, they can't do that anymore. They cannot go back to their homes and, and perform this ritual. Um, and so having talked to other people who have gone through this kind of thing, um, the first couple years, people can say, well, there was this tsunami and the government moved me and I couldn't, you know. But 40 or 50 years later, people think, I'm the one that broke this chain. This chain existed for 500 years or 1,000 years. I'm the one who broke it. And uh, people really have a lot of emotional depression because of the breakdown of traditions. And, uh, and this almost always follows in the wake of communities being disrupted because land is contaminated. 
And uh, so this will be happening. This is happening in northern Japan right now. Um, and it's and there there are no organized efforts to try to alleviate these kinds of social distresses. Um, but uh, in 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 terms, because I know everybody's interested in it, but in terms of the reactors in Fukushima, um, these nuclear incidents, we all know, as, as one scholar said, we all know when they start, but nobody knows when they end because they don't end. Uh, the fuel in Chernobyl is still needs to be dealt with. The, this will be needing to be dealt with for decades. It's, it will take a long time to cool and contain these melted nuclear cores of these three reactors. Um, in addition, there are very big challenges facing us ahead. Uh, the most, one of the biggest challenges is um, the spent fuel pool in the number four reactor. The spent fuel pool has thousands of nuclear fuel rods in it. So uh, tremendous, way, way more uh, radionuclides than were in the three cores that blew up, are in the spent fuel pool um, of the reactor number four. Because of the explosion that happened First of all, because of the earthquake and the tsunami, and then the explosion that happened in the number four building, the building itself is leaning. And the spent fuel pool is up on the top floor. More bad design. Um, so the spent fuel pool, imagine a giant swimming pool big enough to hold a thousand nuclear fuel rods. Imagine the weight of that water, of how much water that is. Uh, up at the fourth or fifth floor, I think it's the fifth floor of a building that is now leaning on somewhat battered land. They put water back in there. Yes, and they have to they have to continually feed water into that. Yes. Um, so now it's being cooled uh, because it has to still be cooled. Um, but they're yeah yeah yeah. Um, what's the size of nuclear fuel rod? Right nuclear fuel rod. That's a good question. Um, nuclear fuel rod. Uh, and this would just be an estimate, but um, it's probably about this much around and uh, perhaps as long as this room. That's only thousands. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But if they had this really heavy pool with the fuel rods on the ground floor, would that have been worse because it would have ruptured? Um, That's a good place to put it. Yeah, well, uh, that's the challenge. There's not a good place to put it. Um, yeah, I, that probably could be true too, but I think to put it up extremely high is not necessarily a good idea either. Um, yeah, they put up high because when they unload the reactors, they do it from the top. Yeah, take so it out. It and it's the shortest distance to have a to have a, a loose rod is if you just pick it up and put it back down. So that's why they're up at that that height. Right. And the risk now is one is to lose water, but then the other is future earthquakes. Absolutely. It's because that building is not stable. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's real concern now that the, all the concrete is starting to... There's cracks in the walls. It's losing its strength, and the steel's losing its strength. And then with repeated earthquakes, if that pool ever goes over... If that pool ever goes over, it could be more dire than the original incident. Much more. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of real challenges. There's There's... Because of the need to continually cool the corium, the core of the plants that's melted, uh, and because of the fact that it's not in, an, it's not in, you know, it's just down at the bottom of the reactor vessel or in the some of the spaces below the reactor vessel, um, a lot of that water just runs off, um, and so that just enters into the groundwater. Um, so, another one other thing, uh, one other thing that I wanted to mention about it is that. Um, there's a lot of, because of the nature, because of the different kinds of forms of, uh, that radiation takes, it's easy for the industry to say things that, uh, that mask some of the troubles. So for example, um, uh, the, the primary danger immediately is, uh, is radiation in the form of what's called gamma radiation. Gamma radiation can go through virtually anything, really anything. Uh, it's like an x-ray, you could imagine it. Uh, so gamma radiation can, it can go through lead, but it's just filtered by lead. Um, gamma radiation is close to the nuclear source. So, for example, when the, uh, when the uh, plants melted down and had explosion, there would be some amount of gamma radiation close to the actual plants them, um, sell, themselves. Uh, there's several different, several different forms, but I'll also mention alpha-emitting particles, which is a different kind 
form that radiation can exist in, which is, uh, which is an iodized particle. These cannot go through really anything. So it can't go through paper, can't go through skin. They're dangerous to human beings when they're internalized into the body. So, um, I, I mean, a really, uh, and please excuse me, Saul, but a, a terrible way to look at it is in a sense that gamma radiation is sort of like just waves and alpha radiation is kind of like tiny particles. Um, uh, but the alpha, the alpha emitting particles will give off some gamma radiation. Um, what happened at Fukushima is that in the explosions, a lot of material goes up into that cloud and then comes down uh, with either precipitation or just comes down because of its weight in the air. And um, so because of those explosions, those plumes went up pretty high, there was a large contamination of material that came from those explosions about 80 to 100 kilometers to the northwest. There were a few different dispersals of this uh, of the, uh, radionuclides in this cloud. Um, a lot of, so these alpha emitting particles can be present and will give off only a tiny, tiny amount of gamma radiation. If you have, if you're reading gamma radiation with a Geiger counter, it can appear that there's very little radiation present, while there are still plenty of alpha emitting individual particles present. And the danger is that if you swallow them, or if you inhale them, uh, or get them through cuts in the skin, um, there's they don't always do this, but there's a chance that they will then deposit in the body at a specific place. Um, uh, for example, uh, iodine, which everybody was hearing about a lot when this happened, to, you know, ends up in the thyroid. Strontium-90 mimics calcium, so it ends up in the bones. So it's possible to then end up with one of these alpha-emitting particles in the body at a specific spot, and that tiny amount of gamma radiation that's not so bad if it's just sitting and irradiating a handful of cells for 10 years or 15 years, um, then it's uh, very possible for it to cause cancers or other diseases. So when, uh, so you, all, the, all the evacuations are all done based on distance from the plant. So the evacuations are out to 12 kilometers. But the, the plant's not emitting a lot of gamma radiation out to that far. There was some contamination out that far. But, uh, a lot of the contamination, a lot of the worst contamination, fell far outside of the exclusion zone, maybe 80, 100 kilometers where Fukushima City is, and even in parts of Tokyo. Um, and so frequently you have public health professionals talking about the radiation danger strictly in terms of gamma radiation and levels of gamma radiation readings. And so in Tokyo, for example, all of the, uh, all of the, Fallout, uh, the, all of the Geiger counters that are part of the city infrastructure are all at about 20 feet high. So alpha particles deposit on the ground. So they, you can read, you can take a reading up here and have it be very different than the reading down here. Um, so it's easy to say in some places that there is no danger. Uh, there's ways to say there's no danger when there may be danger. And right. so it's a very... We don't have, the, the data doesn't show it. Yes. Um, and so, or you can have, or you'll have sometimes people in the industry will say things like, X number of people died in the tsunami, but nobody has died from the nuclear power plants. Well, it doesn't kill people like immediately like a tsunami does, and people know that. And so, it's a the the, the largest toll at Chernobyl, the the worst health toll at Chernobyl was on the children of people who were infants or toddlers at the time of their exposures in Chernobyl. So these things take a while to mat, to present themselves, to so that public health impact of these exposures. We won't know them, really, for 20 or 30 years. Uh, so it's ridiculous to make declarations about them, like it's safe or it's this or it's that. Um, but it's easy to do. And it's easy to do and not be lying. So, uh, so this happens a lot. Um, yeah. Listen, this is a growing up in, I grew up in Japan, and the friends of parents worked with the Adam Bomb Casualty Commission. Right. <clears throat> and what they pointed out was that it's all about percentages. It's very hard to say. This yeah. thyroid cancer came from this. Absolutely. It's just that, like, you know, 30% of these people had it, whereas the general population has 2%, but we don't know about yours. Yeah, exactly. You know, so it's, it's very difficult to tell what the damage is. Exactly. And, th and that's especially true of people whose exposures were from alpha emitting particles, where it's uncertain what their exposure really was. Uh, people who people have, lar like in, in Hiroshima, had large amounts of exposure to gamma radiation. Their health would deteriorate much more quickly, and it is easier to describe causation. But, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, so, yeah. So when you talk about, you know, culture and disruption and, you know, all the mental health issues and things, you know, how do you distinguish, if you can at all even, between what's happened from the Fukushima meltdown and what's happened from the tsunami, where, you know, which was sort of tremendously traumatic and intense yeah. event. So are you, are you trying to figure that out in any way? Or, I mean, I, well, I'm not working on Fukushima. Right. I work in other places, so I'm not really working oh, on there in terms of my own work. Um, it's certainly true that people were completely traumatized. Everything about it. If people who were far away, who experienced that earthquake, were traumatized. I was traumatized just watching on, watching that tsunami come, uh, come onto land. Um, but for example, there are a lot of people who may be experiencing. There, there's a lot of, uh, especially from the nuclear power industry. There's a word that they use called radiophobia which is that people have an unnatural fear of nuclear things, which is probably true, but, uh, but they also have a natural fear of nuclear things. <laughs> um, so, I mean, part of why it's unnatural is because we don't understand it enough, you know. Uh, most people don't understand it enough. But, um, so frequently, there's a lot of people, there's been a lot of stories in the press in Japan that uh, there was no health impact from exposures to radiation, that the problem is anxiety. All of these people, their health problems are because of anxiety, that they're just believing crazy things or they're worried or they're unduly not believing what they're, what authorities are telling them. And uh, in particular cases, that may well be true, but that doesn't excuse the fact that these people have had their lives upended. And if, if they're experiencing uh, physical health problems because they're emotionally distraught because their lives have been upended, that's legitimate too. And even if it's not because of exposure to radiation, they're still victims in this. So, um, so there's a way of blaming the victim, which happens a lot. In, it's easy to do in radiation-exposed cases because people are uncertain. What, how much was I exposed to? What problems will I develop? So because of that uncertainty, it's very easy. And this happens, there was a whole range of articles. You watch in March, there will be again. There's a whole range of articles on the anniversary. Uh, it's the only time the press talks about Fukushima. So because that's the time when the Fukushima stories will be out there, that day, there will be all of these op-eds about how nuclear power is not dangerous, and talking about how nobody died in Fukushima, and that it's all about anxiety. And the nuclear, the people representing the interest of the nuclear power industry will be boldly making that statement that all the problems are because of anxiety. Um, and as I say, even if that's true, that doesn't excuse the, the fact that this was done to these people, even if it is imaginary. Um, either, you know, what's not imaginary is their lives were upended. That's not an engineer. Um, so, Pete, you have. Yeah, I was. Uh, I'm sort of going back to the very beginning of what you were talking about, your own research and the way people tell their stories, and, and the project that you're working on, where you're letting people tell their own stories and different kinds of stories, different kinds of storytelling. It seems to me that I mean, it's it, there are many, many disasters layered on top of one another in, in what you're telling us. But it seems to me that the disaster that that stops any of these disasters from ever get from ever healing is the disaster of lying. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So there's this thing about lying, right, which happens around this and it happens around everything and it happens around you know, it, I mean, it's, it happen, I mean it's, it happens all the time everywhere, almost everywhere, That's right? Crazy. Yeah, it's kind of crazy making. It's it's literally it, it actually is literally crazy making. That's what makes crazy lying. So you know, it's like the movie Gaslight, like gaslighting. You know. So so I, I mean, I I just wanted to say that. I just wanted to call attention to that because because you know, in certain ways, you know, we're listening to this and thinking, okay, so what can I do? What can I do? But one of the things that I think of doing is that I, I try to figure out how not to lie, mm -hmm. personally, yeah. how not to lie, yeah. and how to, like, notice it when mm -hmm. I hear it, and then think about, so what do I do about that particular lie, yeah. right? So I agree with you. I mean, at the core, for a lot of people uh, that I've talked with, at the core of it is a sense of betrayal. And that's really at the core of it. Um, and, uh, and that's really hard for people to forgive. It, I mean, people... I've talked to people who are really angry about having been lied to. Um, I, I was just responding. I, it seems like when I hear the stories about the reasons for the lying, 
is that there's a fear of mass something. Mass hysteria. Yes. Hysteria. Yes. Hysteria. Yes. Mass panic, mass like yeah. people yeah. filling the roads and abandoning or I'm I'm not sure what that's what they said. That's what the government is saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So would that have happened? Well, I mean, if they had said clear out for twenty or fifty kilometers, a lot of people did anyways. Yeah. Um, well, so it's hard. To, it's hard to say. I mean, infrastructure was almost non-existent in the area at the time. So a lot of people, tons of people, evacuated that were outside of that area because they were panicking. So, so part of the crazy-making thing is, mm -hmm. is that you know the recognition that those communities had been lied to for so long yeah. and during during the events and the months afterwards. Yeah. And then, you know, from the United States, those people who've been following it closely, you know, we're looking at our own government yeah. and our own yeah. case yeah. service and, and, you know, the press. And it's like, well, okay, we're probably being lied to also. But then how do, how do you as a society you know, ferret that out and not not be the you know the, the crazy person on the block. There's an option. And I'm wondering if you know if you're seeing that as part of as part of you know judgment <coughs> because I know that they had this whole thing you know that, that there was an issue that they might have to have had to um, evacuate Tokyo. Right. And that that would have been like the huge yeah. panic inducing mm -hmm. yeah. event. And if you see that there's there's this undercurrent of the people in Tokyo that are like, well, maybe we should have, and they just weren't telling us, then yeah, it's, you know, that we were lied to. It's actually very interesting because we went through a process, I think, in our country in the 60s and the 70s, in which people, uh, or people even earlier, lost faith in institutions mm -hmm. um, as a result of the Vietnam War, as a result of Watergate, as a variety of contributing factors. Um, in Japan, that had not happened. Uh, that, that, that was my sense. Um, I know there's some Japanese people in the audience, and please feel free to, to jump in, but my sense was that there was generally a uh, sense that large corporations were large because they did things well. Um, right. And so there was, more, there was not yet the notion that politicians are always lying, the media is in the pocket of somebody. We all think that here. Every, that sort of standard American operating beliefs. Um, but I think my sense is that there's been a real breakdown in the sense that institutions are reliable in Japan. Because we see it, there's been a lot of talk about the comp uh, how complicit the media was with all of these nuclear, uh, with all of the things that were going wrong in the nuclear industry. The government did not function as a regulator. All of these institutions failed. TAPCO was not really maintaining uh, adequate safety structures and so forth. And so, um, so there's a, it seems like a widespread sense that the things that we all took for granted may or may not be true. And, uh, and that can be a real healthy thing in Japan, quite possibly, uh, which has had the same political leadership for essentially since the war. Are um, they being a bit more vocal in those communities? And, and it, it really is. There's a, it's really contentious. It's really contentious now. Um, there's a lot of people that are really angry and a lot of people that are very vocal. There's a tremendous amount of the leadership in the communities that are demanding accountability and, uh, and expressing anger. A lot of the leadership is women, which is also a real interesting development. Um, uh, mothers, uh, especially in Fukushima, um, the Fukushima area. But, uh, but it really feels that there, there's, it just feels like, it feels a little bit like a sea change. And, and that's really interesting, even though uh, there's no political infrastructure at this point to follow through on that. Um, uh, the LDP took power again, um, who had controlled Japan, and briefly didn't control it while the accident happened. And then, to, and then blamed it all on the party that was in control in a year or two. Political brilliance. But, uh, but people in the communities where the reactors are are really upset. One of the other issues that I should mention, too, that's really important in Japan right now is that there's a lot of radioactive debris up in the north. And the central government wants to incinerate it in every prefecture. And to spread it around. Part of it is to spread it around. Part of it is to spread the stigma. So that the north isn't contaminated, but every place is a little contaminated. And it's just people. 
And, and there's other reasons too. I mean, I've heard that uh, that they that there had been this program that built all these incinerators, none of which are operating at 50% capacity. So this is how we solve the problem of an underutilized investment: is we spread this stuff around. It, it establishes a new background. Absolutely right. And yeah. from a scientific standpoint, that's that's kind of what they're doing. And and therefore it's removes the stigma of the north. Yeah. So they're trying to. But it there. exposes the entire population to a higher background level. And so there's a, there's a lot of opposition to the burning of the debris um, in different prefectures. So there's a lot of fighting still. So they around. moved they it all into a big pile and set it on fire? No, they have an incinerator. It's in, you know it's a structure. So you know in theory they say that there won't be any contamination, but these were not built to handle nuclear waste, or right. even mild nuclear waste. So there's no. Yeah. Um, you, you get a lot. There's a lot that comes off that. But they're also uh, disposing into harbors. Yeah. So there's, there, not only is it the contaminated water from Fukushima that's going into the ocean, it's a tremendous amount every day, but they're taking the radioactive uh, contaminated debris and throwing it, in, throwing it in, into harbors and making you know breakers yeah. like we did here in the Bay Area. You Build up tremendous amounts of area with rubble and, mm -hmm. and debris. Uh, after the 1906 earthquake, most of that oh, ended up know. as landfill, made new land. Nuclearly. Yeah, right. Exposed. So that's, that's what they're doing there. But then, of course, what that does is it puts it down into the water and the, the oceans. We're now seeing the impact in the ocean. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, I have a, a, a friend of mine from Kazakhstan who's a uh, um, who's an expert in the uptake in plants and animals of radionuclides. Uh, when I asked him what he thought about the situation in Fukushima, he said, it's all about the sea up there. Yeah. It's just so much is going into the sea. And, um, and, what, and all I can tell you is that nobody knows what that may mean. Yeah. It's a gigantic science experiment we all get to look through because, uh, I mean, there's been, there's been a fair amount of radiation in, in the Pacific for nuclear testing in the past, and it showed up in fish. <laughs> All on the entire rim of the ocean, but uh, but the the entry of such a large amount of radionuclides and over time, um, uh, it's it's shown up in all kinds of fish in Japan already, all kinds of fish in all kinds of seaweed. Uh, but uh, the people I talk to who study that stuff say they have no clue really what's. Maybe we'll get some new superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got now? <laughs> yeah. Um, does the government have any partial ownership in? The government now owns TEPCO because oh, the so value it, fell to zero. <laughs> so did it um, did it have partial ownership before? No, no, it was no. a private company, Absolutely. and they just did they pay them off so that they didn't have. They well, one of the things, and I, this is this is something important to know as an American. Um, uh, they you know they they ended up selling off all of their assets of any value at all mm -hmm. to just these plants, and now the government's taken them over. Um, in America, there is a legal construction for nuclear power plant owners. Um, there's a variety of things to know about nuclear power plants in America. One is that the liability of the plant operator is capped uh, in any accident, no matter how bad it is, at $100 million. So, $100 so, million? So we, the American citizens, insure nuclear power plant disasters with our treasure. It's like um, that with oil spills, too, isn't it? No, well, no, it's not. Uh, it's, uh, there's not a set cap, I don't think. Mm -hmm. to yeah, they, they do. They had to do that because, in order to, um, as part of the to promote the science of the nuclear reactors and the nuclear technology, because it was recognized as being so risky, and these big companies did not want to be liable for it. Mm -hmm. But there was, you know, a huge advantage for the government. So, the government capped it. So they're not viable business models without sure. public. They're not earning a lot of money. Um, you can also separate uh, when when companies have multiple plants in a location, which is usually almost always the case. You can separate each plant into a separate corporation, so that, for example, um, if you had a comparable, I could say I forget how many are at San and three, but, uh, but let's just say one of the nuclear facilities here where there's three plants. One plant has a meltdown, kills people, contaminates, puts people out of work, variety, whatever the liability is. The company that owns it can wall it off from the other reactors so that they don't lose those assets. Um, so in other words, you can have a nuclear plant melt down and you can be liable up to that cap and your nuclear plant right next to it is a separate company. So 
you won't. So yeah, you can maintain true. assets. Um, in, um, so uh, there's that. But anyways, one of the last things I want to talk about is just uh, to talk about my own perspective about being against nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power is, I mean, I don't want to make declarative statements. Like it's insane. But I'll, I'll just make, <laughs> I'll make I'll make substantive statements that it's insane. Uh, some of the waste from nuclear power plants. I mean, the problem with nuclear power plants when we started building them was that we assumed we would figure out a way to solve the problem with the waste, which we have not. Um, aspects of the new, of these spent fuel rods, some of uh, some some parts of it remain dangerous to human beings for over a hundred thousand years. So they have to be protected away from people, so people don't contact them. For longer than we've had civilization. Longer than we've had longer, about as long as we've been Homo sapiens. Um, you know, we haven't had agriculture for. I mean, at one point I did some some silly little basic numbers on it that. Uh, we essentially have to guard this waste for over 3,000 generations. Uh, Jesus lived 60 generations ago. Uh, let's see, Buddha lived 78 generations ago. Um, agriculture began 300 generations ago. Um, humans became behaviorally modern about it was 150 generations, so about half the distance we have to get. And, we, and all of this waste is generated so that we can have electricity for 30 years, 40 years maybe, these power plants, specific power plants. Not even a generation. Not even a generation. And so you, so imagine the cost of this power, because of the, because what it's going to take to protect this for 100,000 years, the cost to us as a society, imagine how valuable this electricity really is, mm -hmm. how much it really costs, and what do we use it for? We, I mean... In Japan, you can't go 10 feet without hitting a vending machine, you know, and there's still a convenience store every two blocks, you know, and so we're, we're wasting this power, uh, just wasting this energy, and the cost to us will be substantial. You would think we should be operating as though it is so valuable and should only be used really intelligently, and that we, we need to conserve it. So we're not, so instead, we're, we have a business model because some people can make money where we generate this waste that is going to be a problem for a huge amount of time, and, uh, and its benefit is tiny. It's really tiny compared to its cost. Um, and I would also point out, because it's frequently spoken of, that nuclear power would, is a way to address global warming, that uh, you can look at nuclear power as a low-carbon source of power only if you look at it during the period of time that the plant is operating. If you look at the milling of the uranium, the mining and the milling of the uranium, and then you add in the carbon footprint of maintaining waste for 100,000 years safely, what, what is that carbon footprint? Does anybody have any idea? How can you claim nuclear power is, is a green technology when we can't even fathom the costs or the carbon requirement for it? Um, so it, it's just insane to me. It's insane that we generate toxins on this level for mundane uses for mundane purposes. Um, if we were using it to, I don't even know what, if we were using it, for, you know, then you could think maybe it's worth the cost to have this benefit, but we're not using it for benefits. It's we're hard using to it for, imagine that. Yeah. It's interesting, it's the, the, and part of the thing with the power plants, they put the power plants in these isolated areas, and part of that is because, well, we all know they're so dangerous, and if there is an issue, there's limited exposure to the population. But um, recently, some of the, the new approach to the power plants is making these, what they're calling portable nuclear plants. Have you heard of these? Yeah. They're, they're like, oh, wow. oh very, sorry, sorry. Um, that there's a new, um, new approach to power plants is to, instead of these big, humongous plants, is to do what they're calling portable power plants. And they're not really portable. They're, they are contained in a thing, but it's a thing like a five-story building, and and that is, yeah. <laughs> and the idea is that you know, uh, countries or entities can now have a nuclear power plant that doesn't cost the billions of dollars, and it's more affordable. But what it does is it takes these real nuclear power plants, these sources, and sticks them everywhere. The idea is that well, we want to do a thousand of these. 
you know, in the next 10 years. This is a new business model that's coming up from the United States to take... Really pushed by Bill Gates. Yeah. And I, I just, I'm astounded that they're, they're going to take these huge sources because it doesn't take, doesn't take a lot to contaminate a population and to take them and we're just going to put them in all these different places. That's just craziness on top of it. I, I, I agree, yeah. After the war, after the Hiroshima, there was a there was this real uptake in Japanese art and manga and the yeah. different things about radiation effects. Yeah. I guess it hit our movies too. Yeah, but really in Japan, and big, Japan time. big time. Yeah. And I'm wondering uh, after Fukushima if there's been any of this. Uh, but there's a lot of been taken up into the manga culture. Or the, a little bit, uh, although I don't read or speak Japanese well enough to. Be to, to be able to say I, I've heard that there's a little bit of of a present in manga, but there's been a lot of art, so okay. a whole lot of music and visual art generated, um, and videos. Uh, there's been a lot a strong artistic response. There's actually, and this is one of the things I'm participating in. But there's a huge push to study how Fukushima happened in social media and society. Uh, because it was a unique event in which um, there, you have this huge crisis, so you have this breaking news moment, and then you have this disinformation around a public health crisis. So there was tons of people, and I'm among them, that was on the internet nonstop at the time trying to gather information. And there was a variety of uh, things that emerged out of that. Communities that emerged out of that, virtual communities that emerged out of that. And so there was a whole lot of studying about this because... <laughs> It's a, it's, you know, maybe the first of something that will be a, a frequent kind of event. But there was a lot of sharing of information about uh, um, Geiger counter readings through Twitter on, online. There's a group called Safecast that was started by uh, crowdsourcing, people donating money, that set up a ring of Geiger counters at the 20, I think at the 20 kilometer point around the plant that are all connected to the internet. So I can go on my phone right now and I can show you the radiation levels entirely anywhere around that area. And it's all immediately accessible on apps online. So this whole, this whole uh, online response to Fukushima is really another intriguing piece for scholars. And, and that's the, the, the one for the world, actually, that there's these websites that you can go on to and where communities and individuals upload their readings on whatever basis. So you can go there and you can look and see what are the current uh, read, radiation readings you know, in your town. Absolutely. And you can get a map on your phone. You can get a map. That's what I always wanted. So that's so. For example, I have a bunch of these apps because these are research. You know, it's research. This is how people are grappling with or trying to uh, understand radiation. So, that, so that's another fascinating thing that's emerged out of this. And uh, um, one of the things. Oh, it's just if you ever are curious, there's there are cameras that are always um, on Fukushima live cams, and there's I think there's a network there's, of three of them. There's two close by. Tepco one runs there. one that's right up by the first reactor, right. and then and there's, uh, there's two other ones. Yeah, one of the new JNN has one 20 kilometers away that gives you the four, and that that one that webcam, the JNN one that's. Uh, from 20 kilometers away is how it was determined that number four was leaning. Yeah. Um, because they just kept denying it. And, and it's great because Tepco was like doing these, they take the, the, uh, the videos and they would re redo them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you there's too many people now that are paying attention. Yeah, there's too many people. But what it does do though is it's very interesting that you can, you can watch the, um, the activities there with the cranes and the closures and the, you know, the stuff that they're doing, but then there's these armies of people yeah. out there that are analyzing you know, what they do every single day. So I just find it interesting that there's a real public focus on making sure at least now we can watch and see what they're doing. To some extent. To some extent, but yeah. now, they're built, now they're covering it. Yeah, they're now they're, they're covers. building covers on, on the number four one, especially. Right. The so, one. Yes. Well, that, yes. so what's happened to the... Um, People who've worked and gone in, and the you know that's a whole separate tragedy. The uh, people who work there's there's yeah, right. there's permanent workers, yeah. but in a case like this, and in any in, in cases where uh, there's crises in nuclear power plants, they bring in a ton of temp workers. Um, temp workers. 
and who they, signed up for this before, or they hire them like? <laughs> They, the it, it, it tends to be run by the Yakuza, the Japanese Mafia. They tend to basically get uh, people who, uh, you know, there's, there's a whole, this is a whole separate issue of uh, what they call the nuclear gypsies in Japan, who are basically like homeless people who just migrate and work at nuclear power plants. One of their incentives is because they're only allowed X exposure, they frequently, when they're working, will take their dosimeters and hide it somewhere so that because once they reach that exposure level, they can't work because they lose their income. So they're trying to get higher exposure. They're not trying to get higher exposures, but they're ending up with higher exposures in order to keep the income. So they're not being managed as, for example, a well-trained, health-focused, you know, they're basically people brought in and just shoveled through. So they just pay them for the day and then that's I don't think, they, I don't think it's a day contract. I think it's a longer contract. Yeah, that's yeah. so many layers yeah. of the uh, contract. So that, that like uh, five layers or seven layers, the bottom of the seven contract. Yeah. Uh, they are really low paid. Yeah. And yeah. they are not really insured for the health. Yes, right. And then many uh, also the foreigners. Yes. Uh -huh. And then after they work, going back to Indonesia or something, yeah. we never know. No record. Then yeah. I get sick there. Yeah. yeah. Right? Absolutely. Thank you. That's exactly the right. The degree is different. Mm -hmm. but, um, in the United States, they're called jumpers. Is that so? Uh huh. And um, uh, and it's the same principle. The degree is different. Right. Because right. of Fukushima, the nuclear gypsy in, yeah. in Japan, there are more of them. There right. are exposed. <laughs> but once you, if you're a contractor, once you reach your limit, you will then jump to some other company's power plant somewhere right. else right. without your showing your work history so yeah. you're not working. So they're called jumpers. Right. Oh, interesting. So what happens but no and nobody can really follow what happens no. But there's no incentive to follow it. Yeah. And the many people, workers are already uh, came up with the allowance of the yes. uh, exposure. So they have to leave. Mm -hmm. And then we don't know those people. And they, and they, they kept bad records of the workers' names and stuff. And they have to sign that we don't disclose anything. Uh huh. Uh -huh. They oh, non disclosure. No, they have to sign. Mm -hmm. So secret. Of course they do. Ah. <laughs> wow. Terrible. Mm -hmm. Also, the, uh, the debris, yeah. uh, incineration, yeah. uh, burning. Uh, you mentioned the ones, but uh, Osaka City yeah. is burning. Uh, um, well, they test burn and they going to do from February. So I mean, it's many happening. Um, it is uh, uh, people is totally uh, opposed that, but eleven people already uh, arrested wow. by Osaka City uh, police. Wow! And then uh, six people are still in jail oh. with no reason. <laughs> it's just they are uh, expressing the. Uh, you know, different opposed opinion yeah. against the uh, city. Yeah. Please do not burn because yeah. it's not healthy. Yeah. Then they were arrested. Mm -hmm. And so we are very fear that uh, Japan is going back towards mm -hmm. uh, like a military. Well, and some of the things that Abe, the new prime uh, minister, has said uh, uh, reinforce that. Yes, it's yeah. very. Um, I don't know what to say. Yeah, a lot of people. When I'm at home, a lot of people are very upset that things are going in the wrong direction. Yes? Like, I think that's not a little bit, but what's the Japanese reaction to the whole thing of being lied to so blatantly? Um, there's a lot of contention. I mean, a lot of people are angry. A, a lot of people are, are really angry, but a lot of people want to still believe, you know, what they're being told. So it's still, there's still a lot of, uh, you know, because the government is still saying, oh, it's safe to live in areas or we're going, or we're going to decontaminate this area so it'll be no problem, and then they're not really doing it well. So some people want to believe it because uh, for young parents, for example, who live 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers away, if you're not going to move to get your children away from from that, you have to tell yourself, well, there's no danger. What they're telling me is true. So families are being split up. It's really contentious. Um, there's. There have been huge demonstrations at the Prime Minister's residence in Tokyo uh, against restarting the nuclear power plants. There have not been big demonstrations about the incident that happened, but large public demonstrations are not traditional in Japan. Right. And so it's 
so it's unusual. So, uh, but the big protests are focused around restarting uh, the nuclear power plants. So just the policy forward as opposed to going backwards. Um, and one of the other things that I wanted uh, to mention that uh, Mary Leo was mentioning to me is important to point out, and it's true, is that there's been, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, but in Hiroshima where I live, the Hibakusha groups, the organizations of survivors, have long been supporters of nuclear power. Um, and after Fukushima, many of the groups have shifted their position to oppose nuclear power. Um, there's a lot of reasons that they were pro-nuclear power, uh, and a lot of them are political. For example, uh, the priorities for this community historically have been to pass legislation about uh, health compensation and health care uh, for survivors. And so at one point, uh, they were given incentive to specifically voice support for nuclear power in return for movement for the bill through the diet that they so they're so they've been used no, political. exactly and they're used because if they support nuclear power then <laughs> why should I mean if they can accept it we should so so they've been used in in the past and, uh, and so there's a lot of so there's been some uh, meetings and some soul searching and discussion and a lot of the groups are now coming out have come out now against nuclear power, and even some have expressed regret at prior positions. Um, uh, and, and one of the things that, that I was mentioning when we talked earlier is that it is heartbreaking. I know for some of the Hibaksha I know in Hiroshima, a lot of the Hibaksha, they wanted, by the end of their lives, they wanted nuclear weapons to be abolished. Um, that's not going to happen. So, but that's what they've been focusing on. A lot of people in these groups uh, their work during their lives. And now, the only Hibakusha left alive were children when Hiroshima and Nagasaki attacked them. Uh, almost 70 years ago. So the people who were alive were the young people then. Same is true of Holocaust survivors now. Um, and uh, to, see, to see the emergence of a huge new cohort of radiation affected people in Japan right before they die is such a tragedy for them. So, because if you didn't eliminate the weapons, you felt at least that this was the end. This was right. the end. This, you know, and there was some anxiety about who can testify about this horror when the Hibakusha are gone. But at least it would be over in a sense. And it, although part of that is just not quite according an understanding of uh, how some of the experiences of people in nuclear test sites were. They were not attacked directly, but. Uh, there's plenty of Hibakusha in the world. That was actually one of the, part of the motivation for when we formed the Global Hibakusha project was to just really emphasize inside Japan the point that well, there's plenty of Hibakusha in the world. It's hundreds of people, unfortunately. Um, but that's so. There's so there's a lot of soul searching going on in Hiroshima. Um, Hiroshima, the piece, the original push to bring nuclear power to Japan in 1955. The goal was to build the first nuclear power plant in Japan in Hiroshima for the same reason that we get the Hibakusha to support it. Because if the people of Hiroshima have a nuclear power plant, it's got to be good. It's got to be safe. And so there was a huge sales push in Hiroshima in 1955 and 1956 to accept nuclear power. Um, so anyways, uh, if people have questions, I, I usually whenever I talk about really depressing things like this. Yeah. Uh, I always like to share one upbeat thing at the end. <laughs> Which, so, yeah. Oh, I have a, um, a little bit of an outside talk. Please. Um, as someone who has been involved in nuclear power since 
yeah. as a comparative analysis. And they have their own reasons, but I'm wondering if you have any research or experience or on what your sense is uh, in terms of intergenerational yeah. um, images yeah. um, that motivate people to join movements to oppose um, nuclear weapons. Um, I mean, that's a really good question, and it's, and it's really tough. I think that our generation experienced this history in a way that younger people uh, can't understand. Uh, the, the, the fear that came with the Cold War standoff between the U.S. and the Soviet Union, it's hard to explain uh, how much that could preoccupy people or how defeating that could be for people. Um, and so I, I find that... Young people completely get the entire thing we got when we were young, but they just use the word climate change, whereas we use the word nuclear war. Um, but they have the same same notions, which is the future is dystopic. I don't know how if our children will live, what will future generations? All of the same pieces we all uh, we all internalize as as kids growing up in the duck and cover era. They all have all of those social pieces, but it's not collect, connected to nuclear weapons for them. Um, because in the world that they live, nuclear weapons are, are not a, a they're not a uh, perceptible threat. Other threats are very vivid and real. And the fact that uh, we know the horrifyingly threatening situation of these weapons on alert status, thousands of you know, um, it is is beyond comprehension. And the and the possibilities of what could happen are beyond comprehension. But there's no context for that. One of the things I would say is that when nuclear testing went underground, it really altered people's uh, experience. Um, one of the things that I argue in my work is that nuclear testing, atmospheric nuclear testing, was a much more intimate experience. It was, first of all, you had visual mushroom clouds present in people's lives. You also had fallout uh, present in people's communities. And so it was, it was a physiological relationship with, with the weapon then. Um, when they went underground, it became really abstract, and I think it's been really hard for a lot of people since then to, uh, to perceive the scale of the threat or the scale of the danger, and it's pretty much impossible to communicate to people, I think. I think you can't, I mean, to, to communicate fully, it's really impossible. Um, and so, unfortunately, just like this event which has us gathered here, uh, Horrible things will make people pay attention to it, and probably nothing else will. Um, I, I've seen with a, a lot of younger groups is that uh, they they get their uh, you know, their moment, their their turning moment with uh, some of the films. Uh huh. Like and which ones? The Threads. Uh huh. Sure. Uh, Carl Sagan's movie, and then uh, 1983. Uh, a day after. Day after. You know, that, those two are really, really powerful, yeah. and I know a number of, of young people that that's when when they yeah, had yeah. their moment. Yeah. And with the with nuclear war. I still think most most young people I think don't have any sense that uh, people now are aware of nuclear power, but even still I think that when it comes to nuclear weapons, you know, it it's just outside of people's frame of reference today. Well, pardon me, I was going to ask you, but there was an announcement today. Was, I had read one article that there was an announcement from the Obama White House of some uh, downscape. Was that, was that anything? Do you know anything about that? Yeah, it's a, a long uh, piece that Jackie Smith did, the Center for Public Integrity. Um, in essence, the, the Nuclear Posture Review yeah. um, started the Obama Nuclear Posture Review, which was um, not enough to be kind of uh, started a review of um, targeting and implementation and what the policy should be. And the White House got a little bit trumped by um, a reporter here. But, um, uh, they were considering the idea that um, uh, it would not harm U.S. national security to have few fewer targets yeah. as long as we kept all the cities and the militarily important ones yeah. and therefore we could have a few fewer long range strategic um, nuclear weapons and a few fewer reserve nuclear weapons. What most people don't realize is the numbers you hear are all the time are only 
the ones that are deployed. We have a second arsenal called the reserve arsenal, and a third arsenal of retired weapons that we're not yet deploying. Called the super secret reserve arsenal? And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're still making them. And we are still making them. New one. And uh, they're, now they're called modified, but they are severely modified, yes. I would call them new. Um, and uh, and so that is sort of the import of it. It will be very interesting to see if there's a backlash from this very, very modest, common sense. Oh, of course there will be. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I think nuclear weapons are really just outside of people's minds. Um, I, I talk a lot about their cost now, because yeah, yeah. that's something that's salient, but, but the actual moral questions and the actual impact of nuclear war is, is, is very difficult for young well, people. I, and I've attack. long been arguing that the way to attack, the way to attack as anti-nuclear activists is the money. Um, because we've been right about the moral question for 70 years. They're not arguing against us. Uh, we're talking to ourselves, but when we talk about money and social priorities, yeah. They're vulnerable. That's the way I look at it. Um, yeah. Well, that's a point that uh, San Onofre, San Onofre's been closed for um, the whole year, essentially. Yeah. But ratepayers have paid for a billion dollars. Yeah. For what? So, I mean, I think that's amazing. People would know that. What does that say about nuclear power? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Well, this is a hot discussion, but. You sounded like you were ready to tell the final. Oh, oh, sorry, but yeah. you don't tell it yet because I, I thought this might be a good time to just mention uh, that we have such great uh, anti nuclear organizations in the Bay Area, Absolutely. including Tri Valley Cares. Tri Valley Cares is Mary Leah. Yes, fantastic. thank God. Yeah. She's out there at Livermore. But uh, also on Sunday, the other one that I think is really as great as Western States Legal Foundation. They're having their 30th anniversary. Nice. And Dennis, uh, Dennis Kucinich is wow. going to make his wow. first speech since <laughs> stepping down wow. from nice. Congress. And Barbara Lee will be introducing him. And Daniel Ellsberg will be there if he gets on the plane. Oh, is that those flyers there? Yes. You, there's a I couple of flyers for them right over here. One for everybody. <laughs> and uh, it's just going to be a great event in Oakland. Oh, great. In the afternoon and evening. So um, another a chance to hear more and plug in a little bit with what things that you might be able to do that would be within your, your purview. Oh. So I have these cards. Oh, right? Thank you very much. And in the one more <laughs> yes. please. Mm -hmm. um, many anti uh, nuclear movement. And one of them is uh, called No Nukes Action. Yeah. Um, we are organizing the every eleventh of every month at the front of the Japanese consulate in San Francisco. Nice, I heard we about We are <laughs> signing <laughs> up and then uh, we try to uh, uh, voice out. Ah, gambate. Yeah, gambate. And we're writing oh. that a demand letter to uh, each time prime minister. And okay. then uh, that group, I mean, getting bigger slightly. Nice. Slightly, but people find out. So if you want to do something, participate for the anti-nukes, mm -hmm. uh, please get together. That's yeah. um, what? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. On the 11th of every month. Yeah. And what's the address? 50 Fremont. And that's near? Near, uh, uh, in, from like two minutes ago from Embarcadero Park right. Station and uh, near Market. So that's right. Monday. Yeah, Monday's coming up. Levi. I saw my copy of um, Build the Whole Nuclear Future. I was wondering if you would be willing to sign it. Uh, <laughs> and, and by the way, my good friend Judy Hiramoto, whose chapter is in that book as well, is joining us. Uh, uh, there you go. Maybe you should do a little sign up sheet so that we can have an email group in case people want information about. Yeah, cool. Also, I left a stack of my cards on the little thing here if anyone wants my business card. So is there access to this Web2 thing you were talking about? Like oh, web, shared, uh, sharing information? And we're building that website. Oh, you're doing Yeah, that. so it's not done yet. Because we're partly also layering in some protections, for example, um, some stories or things people want only shared oh. among other uh, Hibachi communities and some. So uh, we're actually uh, 
uh, taking a lot of energy and time to put together the website. Kind of energy. That would be my kid. Uh, I, I worked one time in Massachusetts for the, as environmental coordinator for Mel King when he was running for Congress. He's yeah. an African American leader, a very wonderful guy. And uh, yeah, Chernobyl happened during yeah. this period. And uh, so we put, we had, we were developing literature, and we got a quote from Mel, and this is what he said. It's about, and he said this at a Seabrook rally once, it's about power and energy, but it's our power and our energy. Nice, <laughs> nice. All right. Uh, well, um, so uh, nu nuclear weapons, nuclear power, these are really big things. Um, so this is this is the thing that I try to share in the end because I a lot of people a lot of people here have uh, have been or are activists as well. Um, it's always tough when you're an activist to not burn out when you're trying to fight something big. Um, and so one of the things that's really important to me is a quote from my favorite writer in the world, Doris Lessing, uh, British novelist. Uh, she once said that. Um, all of the things that just totally intimidated her and frightened her about society when she was young, when she became an adult, uh, that seemed too big to ever change, uh, at, she's now in her 90s, at the end of her life, they're all gone. And by that, what she meant was the British Empire, uh, Stalin, Soviet Union, that these things just seemed so big and evil and hard to fight that she just always felt like there was nothing could be done about it. But now, none of them, they don't exist anymore. So she said that people should remember that in history, everything is going to pass. So every little thing you do to fight against these huge things is a part of how it ends. Uh -huh. So feel empowered. That's, that's Even with the most mundane little thing that you do, that's a part of how the whole thing ends up changing. So that always gives me the energy to just, you know, when you're fighting against nuclear weapons, it seems like, what can I do to fight against nuclear weapons? Well, fight against nuclear weapons. That's what you can do, because they will be gone. Yeah, we, we, we stopped a couple from ever being created. Yeah. There's no yeah. robust nuclear earth penetrating bomb. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Warheads. Absolutely. Um, yeah. but, uh, so this work all pays off. And we in, still have what much more to do. Absolutely. So everybody, you know, have, have faith that you can get done what you work on. Thank you. Thank you all for coming here, and especially Brian and Julie. Yeah.